Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. In today's episode, we highlight unconscious biases. What is an unconscious bias? Unconscious biases, also known as implicit biases, are the underlying attributes and stereotypes that people unconsciously attribute to another person or group of people that affect how they understand and engage with a person or group. Now, there are many unconscious biases, but I'm here just to name a few. I am sure you have heard of the halo effect, but what is the halo effect? The halo effect is the tendency people have to place another person on a pedestal after learning something impressive about them. We do this often in the hiring process, college degree versus not, elite school versus community college on a resume. We may unconsciously favor a candidate over another simply by judging a candidate on the merit of the name brand education and not their qualifications. Another one, ageism. That is right. Ageism in the workplace is a tendency to have negative feelings about another person based on their age. And sadly, I see and hear this one all too often. Sorry, folks, but millennials didn't ruin everything. Baby boomers are not all old, etc., etc. Oddly enough, 58% of workers start noticing ageism when they enter their 50s. With age comes wisdom. It would serve us all well to collaborate with each other other than have unconscious biases towards one another. Another unconscious bias, one that we will discuss today, gender biases. According to a study that was published in 1999 on sex roles found that men and women prefer male candidates. That is correct. Men and women both prefer male candidates so much, in general, a male is 1.5 times more likely to be higher than a woman. This is not a male, female, or other issue, This is a human issue. We as humans created an unconscious bias about so many aspects of life, height, beauty, name recognition, the list goes on. Admittedly, I am still identifying my own unconscious biases, and there are times I was not aware of those biases existed in my own mind, but some do. The best advice I can give others is talking to each other. Find time to explore biases that plague others as they may reveal biases we never knew of, including some that may affect ourselves. I would encourage my listeners to take time to understand others' pains and sufferings. Put yourself in other people's shoes. It is surprising what you will learn when we're put in uncomfortable positions. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. has studied human behavior for the last two decades. Experiencing brand and marketing strategy from time at Nike, Oakley, TEDx, Youth, and others, she is an advocate, a consultant, a coach, and the founder of Eliminate Girlhood. Please welcome Dawn Hanks. Dawn Hank from Eliminate Girl Hate. Dawn, how are we doing? Doing well, how are you? Did I pronounce your last name correctly? No. Hank? Hanks, like Tom Hanks. Hanks. I missed the S. Yeah. There's multiple. Just like Tom. Just like Tom. What are wait, are you related to Tom? No, but oh. the weirdest thing, people ask me that all the time. <laughs> and in in junior high school, I used to tell people he was my uncle all the time. I was a big huge liar. <laughs> so everybody at Whitford Intermediate, I'm super sorry. <laughs> this is great. Don Hanks, <laughs> there you go. Tom Hanks' cousin, there you go. is with me today there on the Shades go. of Entrepreneurship. <laughs> Let's introduce the world to Don. Don, please introduce yourself. My name is Don. I'm a Portland local, born and raised. Uh, been working in the sports, lifestyle, health industry for about over 20 years. I don't like to say that out loud, but <laughs> I'll do it for you. So what sports and what were you used to do in the past? I worked at Nike for a while. I spent a really large part of my career at Oakley. And then I worked on the publishing side of business and kind of trade publications. So I worked with a lot of action sport companies during that time. Gotcha. And so, so what do you do now? 
I own my own business now. Nice. So well, I'm an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur. Eliminate <laughs> girl hate. Let's talk about it. What What does eliminate girl hate do? Eliminate Girl Hate is a boutique consulting agency that specializes in gender equity. So I go out, I speak, I do keynotes, workshops, and then I do individual coaching for women to ha- kind of help them find their way in the professional world. But for men, how to navigate gender equity and diversity issues as they are coming more and more into the forefront. And how long has uh, Eliminate Girl Hate been around? Tricky question. Uh, my business has been around since 2014, but like a lot of entrepreneurs, or in my case, a solopreneur, when you originally kind of start, it's all under your own name, right? So it's been around since 2014, and then I rebranded under the Eliminate Girl Hate this year. Gotcha. And so how did, how did you originally start this? Uh, I was working in Oakley and I was traveling and I had just finished a nationwide tour where I was talking about the economy of gender in sport. And it was hugely successful, um, did really well, and I won an award for it in the optical industry as one of the 50 most influential women in the industry for that year as an innovator because of what we were talking about in the form of gender in sport. And when I came back, I was with a company and someone, a very high profile leader at that organization said, I don't know why we hire women at a men's company, especially in leadership positions. And I just, I can't explain the feelings that happened in my head, but it, you know, as someone who'd been working in the industry for a long time, you're no stranger to the sexism or, or the things that you face as a woman in that industry. But for whatever reason, that particular comment really got to me um, because it limited my future. And I managed a lot of people as well. And it limited the future of those that were women that reported into me. And I just felt like I couldn't let the comment go by. And, um, and so I didn't. And it was the beginning of the end for me, I think, in Oakley and in California, because I wanted to come home anyways, but it was the beginning of the end of me wanting to continue to do that line of work. I wanted to do something that had a greater impact and that would make it so that other women didn't hear that statement. Where did, where did that come from? That, that, that cause to want to make a bigger impact? (laughs) I think it's always been there. I was that obnoxious kid when I was little who protested everything. Like I got the Coke machine taken out of the school. (laughs) I did sit-ins for the Gulf war. I was really obnoxious. And, um, for a good cause. But when I started to work in the place there, there there's so many things when you're working in the corporate world that come up and they're little things at first, and then they just start becoming bigger things and bigger things. And when I did this speaking tour, it was so fascinating to me how many women had had similar experiences to me, how many women who did very well in their career weren't being paid for it. And how many women were facing this, dilemma of being authentic to who they were as women and fitting in in a corporate environment. And I had so much pain and struggle in that. I just could not see being a manager of people and not doing something about that. Nice. And so if if a client hires you, what can they expect kind of like some services, you know, from the consulting uh, piece from, from your team? Sure. Depending on what they're looking for, what we do is go into organizations and even educational institutions to help them understand equity in their environment. Um, It's not, we can come in and we can give a speech. No problem. I love talking in front of an audience. It's my Beyonce moment, quite frankly. (laughs) Um, But what we would like to do instead is work with them to understand the type of organization that they are and the struggles that they have and know directly from their employees, not just from the leadership of what's going on, and be able to provide services, educational opportunities, workshops, trainings that will really meet the needs of their unique environment, because that's how I would do individualized coaching. And right now, there's a lot of people who are going to go out there and talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, and all these initiatives that are going out there. And, And And we could do something wider than that. But there is such a gender issue in our workplaces. It is so prevalent. And it isn't something that we really talk about except for on March 8th every year on International Women's Day. And so I just, you know, we come in and we want to work with you to develop the content that makes the most sense for your team. Yeah, let's let's talk about some of those, you know, why why this is so important. Sure. You know, let's let's uh, drop some stats. (laughs) That's the hard one. Well, I will. I wrote some down so that I could make sure that I got. 
a lot of people ask me why this matters. And to yeah. me, it really matters because of things like 50% of the world's chronically hungry people are women and girls. Excuse me, that's 60%. Globally, 132 million girls are out of school and less than 20% of the world's landowners are women. And that's straight from UNICEF. So right away, you can talk about the financial security and independence of women. And we have more women in the world than men. So you're talking about more than 50% of the population that doesn't have financial equity. Then when you talk about, we also make 81 cents for every dollar. As a white woman, that's what I make. When you go into women of color, you dramatically decrease that. Um, There are fewer CEOs who are women than our leaderships named David. Leaders who are named David. Wow. That's my favorite stat to throw to people because it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. I didn't know there were so many people named David. <laughs> and then 35% of the, women's world, uh, the women of the world have experienced some sort of sexual, physical, or intimate violence from someone that they know. So everywhere that we go as women, we are told and we are shown that we are not worthy of the places and spaces that we go into. And for me, you cannot do things when you don't feel worth and you don't feel your place in the world. And so it's really important to me. I don't want to just list off a whole bunch of bad stats. That Mm -hmm. sucks. There's some great news out there. Women are getting educated in ways that they've never been educated before. Um, Over 50% of all degrees, when you talk about bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and PhDs go to women. They are getting educated in levels never before seen. Before I left the corporate world, I made more money than my mother. I made more money than my grandmother. I made more money than my father's, both my father and my stepfather. And that is something that was never before possible. But then you look at the stat you and I discussed before we went on the air, that December, the total job loss was purely affecting women, while men gained 16,000 jobs in the month of December alone. How is it that we are at our lowest levels of women in the workforce in 2021, and it's not by their choice? Man. Sorry, I just went on for that, a very long No, that time. was, that's deep. Like that's, <laughs> we were talking about that stat because I, I thought that was so incredible, that stat that were, you know, December of 2020, all of the job losses were women, mm-hmm. all of them. Yeah. That's, that's, that's just incredible. You know, when you've been creating this, um, what, what would you say is an unconscious bias that you probably see most regularly? Mm. It's a really great question. I think that, that we should be quiet, that we should be demure. You know, a lot of the, we straddle a line as women in the corporate world because in order to compete, you have to quote unquote, uh, act like a man. But if you act like a man in a corporate environment, you are penalized for it. So, so often I've heard that I was too aggressive, that I spoke up too much, that I was too, I'm using air quotes again, passionate. And until I was in my thirties, I never had the language to be able to counter that. And in my 30s, I had a boss tell me I was too aggressive, that I needed to tone it down, that I needed to kind of just simmer a little bit. And I turned to him and I called out a male colleague by name and said, am I more aggressive than, we'll call him Bill, am I more aggressive than Bill? And it shut down that conversation so quickly because I was so clearly not as aggressive as Bill was. I just happened to be a woman, right? You know, until... I may mess up the year, but I believe it's 1992 or 93. Women in the Senate still were required to wear dresses. Oh, interesting. The pantsuit didn't exist, right? <laughs> and they the were required. The pantsuit wasn't around. Yeah, they were required to wear dresses despite all of the things that might make that more difficult for them to do their daily work and be comfortable in doing their daily work. Yeah. So it's small things like that that are unconscious that most of us don't even know are the laws of our land are the policies of our companies and our organizations, the pay structure. So many companies will not be open about pay. I found out at a job I was working that I made $100,000 less than my male counterpart who did not have a degree and who did not have experience at the same level that I did. Man, It's huge, right? Yeah. And so I think the reason it's a difficult question is because there are a lot of them and there's so many we don't know. Yeah. Man, that's, that's true. And you know, have, so now you're starting your business owner. Mm-hmm. 
Have you felt any of those biases? Have you felt any difficulties as, as a, you know, female business owner? And if so, what, what have you experienced? I think it's more based on soft skills. I think when somebody says that they're a consultant or a coach or a speaker, we all think about the guy ripping the phone books or, you know, or the people. Sell me this pen. Exactly. Sell me this pen. Exactly. And that's not really what I do. It really, whether it's an organization or an individual, it's so one-on-one that touch and it's touch might be the wrong word to say, but that connection that is being formed. Right. And so I think a lot of people don't value that as because it is a soft skill. They're looking for somebody that can come in and say, okay, if we have this talk today, when I'm done, your business will grow 40%. That's not true. But do you know that if you have equity in your company, you, the average company has a 41% increase in revenues when men and women are treated equally in those organizations. Mm. Was was there ever a moment like thus far creating, you know, uh, eliminate girl hate that you're like, you know, maybe I should have stuck stuck with the corporate world. Yes. Really? Every single day. Really? And any entrepreneur that tells you otherwise, I think is full of whatever. Um, part of it is the stability. Um, as women, we are taught to want stability. Um, that's what we look for in our partners and our mates. That's what we're told as women we need to hold on to as far back as when we had, um, oh, the word is escaping me, but when we were had arranged marriages, right? Um, that security and that financial security was so important to the life of a woman and what she could have. The world being different, I set my own financial security there's a thing in my brain that says, how dare you turn down a good job with a good paycheck and medical insurance and benefits and all of those things, a 401k. Oh, um, <laughs> and, and go and do your own thing. Who are you? And we use the word imposter syndrome way too much. I know it's a big deal and all of the conversations and I feel it, but I, I don't think women are alone in that imposter syndrome. I think that when you strike out on your own, The hardest thing for me has been the fact that I have to do everything. I don't get to do just the parts I love. I really am the person who is making every post, who's writing every letter, who's stamping every envelope, who's putting away every t-shirt and, you know, everything. And so the, the corporate world, I didn't have to do that. I got to manage that. And so I had a confidence shake. I had a humbling experience on what I didn't know. Um, and I think that I, I want so badly for it to work when it's your passion, when it's something you love, you, you can't take a day off and you can't have a day of, I'm feeling like crap today and I'm going to take a break. If you do, nothing happens. And that that's really hard. You know, I, we talk about that all the time in customer service as well. I always say, you know, you don't, wake up every morning and put on the ugliest outfit and then go blame the world for what you look like. Yeah. You know, you just can't do it. Yep. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of the same kind of same rules apply. Yeah. You know, have, have, I would say, you know, for the listeners at home, you know, that are interested in starting a business, what do you feel you have learned uh, through this process? Maybe the technical part of like, you know, filing an LLC mm-hmm. or whatever, what are some tidbits that you've learned? Like you can kind of say, Hey, think about this when you're starting a small business. I will say two things before I give anything practical. One is give yourself the space and grace that you give to others. So often we don't do that. Um, The second one is that you don't have to do everything right away. You know, I make, I'm a list person, but I I do daily lists. Sure, who doesn't? To-do list, all those. But I have a monthly list and it's three to five things that these things are the most important things I do this month for the next step of what's to come sales funnels, right? If I'm talking practical, it's sales funnels. It's how do you get and create automated sales funnels so that you're not spending your hours in a way that can't be billed for, or that can't be uh, productive, you know, just things that could be easier automated. So creating those sales funnels would be the biggest thing. And so for what the, for listeners at home, what, what is a sales funnel? Ways to contact your customer, ways to stay in contact with them, let them know what you're doing, let them know who you are. 
The other thing that I think is really important, and this I can't take credit for, uh, my coach, his name is Harris. He um, works with an organization called the Story Gatherings. If you've never heard of it, it's just an amazing group. They have a, a, a story is their conference, and it's all about storytellers in the world. And he said to me, if people don't know what you're doing, then they can't help you. And I will say as a woman, asking for help is probably the biggest challenge that I have. I have this ingrained thing in me that if I'm going to do it and be successful and people are going to value that success, that I have to do it alone. And it's been very helpful to understand that that's not true. And when you start telling people what you're doing, so many people are interested, even if your brother isn't or your sister isn't or your parents aren't or your grandparents or the people in your close circle, a lot of times they don't understand what we're doing and they don't support it the way we think that they should, not because they don't believe in it and want it, but because they maybe don't get it or because it changes the dynamic or they're worried about you. Whose mother wants to hear that you're leaving a corporate job to start your own business, right? (laughs) Um, And so remembering that and finding that community that you need in people who maybe don't know you well enough to have that same worry for you and can root you on and cheer you on and support you and tell you when you're going down the wrong path. Definitely. I think that's important to have those individuals that are, they're going to hold you up, like kind of bring you up that corporate ladder, but they're also going to grab you when you're falling down it. Yeah. And tell you like, do you know what you just did today? Be honest. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. That was amazing. Or that sucked. You know, I think that's a big thing too. You know, it's, I feel like a lot of times people are, are apprehensive uh, to really um, celebrate the wins. Mm -hmm. No, celebrate those wins. You know, I, you know, I sometimes talk with some of my buddies and I'll tell them some things and I get like ridiculed about it, you know, Mm -hmm. made fun of them. Like, no, I'm trying to celebrate this win for you. In fact, I would love to hear about your wins too. Like we should be doing this together because at the end of the day, I want to surround myself with successful people. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's kind of what I really want to do. You are and, the five people you hang out with. Well, you know, I talk about that in this <laughs> podcast so often. Oh man, the, it loops around, man. I'm mm-hmm. telling you. So I'm going to have to challenge you because, you know, you talked about, you know, so one of the biggest challenges is asking for help, but I'm going to challenge you. Okay. How do the people at home help? How do they get involved? Well, I think it's easy. Number one is checking your own biases and, and being open to conversations, whether it is about gender equity the racial injustices that are happening in our country right now, the immigration issues that are happening in our country right now, there are a lot of disenfranchised people. So it's not just women, right? There are a lot of disenfranchised people. And the more that we reach out and learn about it and are open to hearing of those experiences, the better. If you want to directly work with us, we have a website, it's eliminategirlhate.com. You can contact us on there. We're on Instagram, Type in eliminategirlhate.com or eliminate girl hate, excuse me, and you'll see us on there. And just reach out. Even if you're an individual who is stuck in your career, you don't know what to do. Let us let me and let us help you understand what that is and really go towards your purpose and passion. Because in my opinion, the only way to be truly successful is if you are going towards your purpose and passion and you invite community to come and go along with you. Definitely. What advice would you have for those individuals at home? Or even for a younger self, a younger, a younger Don. It's funny. I think I already said it, but it is the grace and space. I think we, we look at other people and we have such admiration and respect for what they're doing. And then we look at ourselves. And even when we win to our earlier conversation, not only do we not celebrate it, we almost don't even recognize the win. I can give you an example when I, so my original plan I've been speaking and consulting and coaching, but I wasn't going to turn it into a brand. I was just going to do it for the fun of doing it. And I decided I would write a book. Still working on it, so I'm not going to give you any details. Nice. You can come back and talk about it. <laughs> a children's book and then a book for adults. And and when I spoke it out loud to my coaching group and my, my kind of team, if you will, um, they they were like, that's great. We love it. But I think there's something more to that. And then I was sitting on a call with 70 people and I was wearing a t-shirt that said eliminate girl hate. You can find them all over the internet. There's a ton of them, all sorts of different ones. And I was wearing one and all these women started direct messaging me and they were like, I have to know about your business. I want one of your t-shirts. And I kind of looked down and I was like, and I just had this lightning bolt of a moment. And it was like, my whole life has led to eliminate girl hate. 
And I went that night and I purchased the URL. I did not think it would be available. I thought it would be ridiculous. $23, purchased the URL and didn't do anything, right? Didn't even tell anybody I did it. And then I had a one-on-one call with a coach and I said, I bought the URL. And he lost his ever-loving mind. (laughs) He celebrated me in such a way that I, I was very uncomfortable with at first and I was like, dude, it's $23 purchase. Like, it's not that big of a deal. And he said, how many people would have had that thought and just said, well, maybe I should check it out and not do it. And it was that tiny little permission that others give us that I think is important we give to ourselves. The permission to dream about something and keep dreaming about it and making the dream slightly bigger. Because I will tell you that two weeks after purchasing that URL, the book went on hold for a little bit and the business changed a complete rebrand, a new website, a new social, so many new things happened in those two weeks, just from having that moment of realization and that moment of permission. And so I think if we can give ourselves that permission to do that and stop worrying so much about what everybody else is telling us we need to do, that's how we got here in the first place. Yeah. Do you feel like looking back on it all at any point, did you feel lucky? Well, look, we are, we were born in a certain time where we're all really lucky to be born when we were born, um, born where I'm born, uh, born who I was. So in that respect, yes. As for the business, I never felt lucky. I feel a calling. I feel called to do it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Don Hanks. On the Shades of Entrepreneurship. Thank you so much for those at home. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.